And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And welcome to the show this morning, of course. I'm your host, Lance Roberts, and uh, it is the last week of March. And again, forgive my voice a little bit. I lost it last week. Found it on Friday morning. I did the show with Adam Taggart and lost it again on Saturday and Sunday. So we'll see if I can make it through the show today. Um, everything's good. Can we just start by just saying something real quick? We're just going to st stop remaking 80s movies. Just stop it. All you're doing is messing them all up. So this, yeah, over the weekend, my wife and I watched the remake of Roadhouse. That was a mistake. Here's my advice. Go watch the original Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze and then go to bed. That's all you need to do. Conor McGregor, great fighter, terrible actor. I don't know. When they were coaching him to do the, the, his role, they gave him no acting lessons, apparently. So I don't know what the thing was. Stop making 80s movies. I mean, you know, I'm going to give Dune a try. They've, they've done a remake of Dune. Yeah. I haven't, I, I've been reticent to try it yet, so we'll see. But <laughs> most of these 80s movies are remaking. Stop doing it. Yeah, just you, leave them alone. You creative types either write a sequel or a prequel. Well, look, it's just like Star Wars, right? You know, oh, yeah. it, it, Star Wars or Indiana Jones, the last Indiana Jones was terrible. You know, <laughs> because we all have to inject all this political stuff, right? And, yeah. and the thing is, is that you're taking, you know, people don't love the franchise. They love the characters and mm -hmm. they love the story. Mm -hmm. And so when you start changing the stories and the characters, that's where you're losing your audience. To, to Disney hasn't learned this yeah, yet. Yeah, to fit a political yeah. agenda. Well, not only yeah. that, but I mean, just... You know, you don't mess with the characters because people are in love with the characters and, yeah. and you stay with the storyline. And so anyway, especially fanatics of you know, Star Wars fanatics or anything else. So, we want to be entertained, not indoctrinated. Well, just entertained and have a good storyline. Please. Whatever it is, right? So yes. anyway, stop making movies. <laughs> just go make, go make. And, and the other thing is, is what? You can't come up with original stories now. I mean, you have to keep remaking old stuff that we grew up with. So, right. <laughs> anyway, a um, couple of things uh, this morning, uh, of course, as we get into this week. This is the last week of March, and we are on track for the fifth positive month in a row. Uh, that is a very, very long stretch for markets to be up on a month-over-month -month basis. Can it go longer? Absolutely. Don't, di don't discount that at all. Markets can remain irrational longer you can remain uh, solvent. And that's what's been going on here. But it's been a very steady increase, 21 weeks in a row. Markets are up 25%. And again, just nothing has really deterred that advance. And again, as we've talked about before, this, this kind of boost has been supported by a record level of inflows. We've just seen massive amounts of monetary inflows into U.S. markets from international markets. International markets are underperforming U.S. markets. And so that's attracting foreign inflows. So between domestic inflows into the markets as well as foreign inflows, you have a lot of money coming into equities at this time, pushing equities higher. So what you have now are fully invested bears, and this is just keeping the markets uh, rising for now. Again, nothing wrong with that, just something to pay attention to. And we'll get into a little bit of the technicals here in just a minute. Uh, this week, we've got PCE out on Friday. So that's the next inflation report that everybody will be looking closely at. Again, Nothing real surprising with the inflation data, as we saw last week. Yeah, inflation's coming in a little bit higher than expected, but that's not un unusual. You know, when we talk about economic data, whatever it is, nothing declines in a straight line. So as stuff is, is, is declining and we are in a de disinflationary trend, you're going to have bounces in the data along the way. Just economic activity is going to cause that. 
And, and so we're seeing that type of activity. Everybody gets, you know, you know starts talking about, oh, inflation's coming back. Nah, not really. You're just having a bit of economic, you know, pickup along the way. And, and the economy's still growing just fine. So you have a lot of demand in the economy. You've got a lot of, of things that are going on within the economy reflecting economic activity. But again, some of this really kind of, you know, doesn't kind of jive with some of the other stuff that we see going on. We hear about people, you know, having trouble making ends meet and, you know, the cost of living at home, etc. So those are the things that are going on, you know, behind the scenes. But everything is fine from the standpoint of the market. And the question is, is, of course, kind of what happens next. <clears throat> okay. So, a couple of things to, to think about here, and here's what you need to know before the bell this morning. Again, very strong advance over the last 21 weeks, five months in a row uh, on the positive upside. Again, very, very long in that stretch. The one thing we keep paying attention to is this indicator right here, which is this moving average convergence divergence line, which has just been stuck at a very high level. This is a little bit unusual that markets are this kind of this complacent for so long. In other words, um, you know, we talk about markets can remain overbought for longer. And this has been one of those periods where the market has just remained overbought for a very long period of time. Now that will end at some point. Question is, is what, what ends it and when does it end? But again, for right now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the market. Importantly, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, and this has not changed at all, is this very narrow defined trend channel that the market remains in. We trade from the bottom of the trend channel, which is the 20 day moving average to the top of the channel, then right back down again. This morning, futures are pointing a little bit lower and that's gonna come right after we touched the top of this trend channel last week. So again, it's been a very easy trading market. You just basically buy stuff and it goes up. And we're starting to see the markets broaden out a bit, which is encouraging. But again, this is that complacency that continues to tick into the markets really kind of across the board. And we see this in, in multiple areas, but as is usually the case, we can take a look at the volatility index as a good example of compression. And again, we see that same, same idea here, markets overbought, very, very, very low volatility, very compressed activity, not a lot of movement. So again, eventually this is going to end. The question is, is what causes to end? What, what event occurs that, that does that? And I don't have the answer for that. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, outside of that, as, as we start talking about the markets, you know, we're starting to see a lot of speculative activity come back in. As we talked about recently, you know, Bitcoin has been kind of one of the, the indicators and we've seen a lot of inflow into Bitcoin after the uh, issuance of the Bitcoin ETF. So a lot of speculative activity. Uh, the meme coins started doing pre-sales again, and this is something we haven't seen for a while, but this is kind of the height of speculative activity where meme coins are doing pre-sales. They raised $100 million in pre-sales for meme coins. Uh, again, and th there's nothing wrong with that other than that's just kind of that speculative activity kind of hitting a peak. Uh, and the markets, again, once, once greed and excitement set into something, then people kind of go, well, I don't really care about the fundamentals. I just don't want to miss out. So I've got to throw money at it. And that's what we're seeing. So we're seeing, you know, IPOs come to markets, Reddit, et cetera. You know, questionable issues about the, the, you know, the fundamental underpinnings of Reddit. How monetizable is that business actually? Can it support a public structure? Does it matter? There's a big demand by investors to get into new assets. So again, Wall Street's happy to provide those new assets. So we're seeing those type of activities again. That's more normal of a later cycle move in the markets. So again, doesn't mean markets are going to correct or crash tomorrow, but just something to be aware of as you think about your portfolio and how much risk you're taking within it. Again, markets are very bullish right now. There's nothing wrong with the markets. No reason to not be invested. Just be aware that risk is building for a correction in the market at some point. It may, it may be months before we see one. We'll see what happens. Anyway, all right, quick break, come back. We've got a lot of stuff to get into. We're gonna talk a little bit about market psychology. Uh, when we come back from the break, don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. 
The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven-layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com, realinvestmentadvice.com. Com. The Real Investment Show. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. So, uh, I told you, uh, I guess it's a little over a week ago now since I was out last week, I told you about our coffee pot saga at the house. And that our coffee pot had decided to just automatically start brewing coffee all by itself one night. And then it caught on fire and, you know, it was a whole big deal. So we ordered a new coffee maker, uh, which we got in. And uh, that's been very interesting because we, we got it in on Saturday and I'm uh, sorry, on Thursday. And my wife was traveling and, and uh, she's like, don't touch the coffee maker. I wanted to, I want to set it up when I get home. And I'm like, OK, no problem. So I left it alone. She gets home on Saturday and she sets this she sets this coffee pot up in the uh, in the kitchen. And uh, so this morning. Right. So she said so we used it over the weekend. It's fine. Right. It's all good. And so. She sets it to go off at, uh, you know, early this morning. So, you know, when I get up out of bed, I get in shower, cleaned up. I feed the dogs, let the dogs out, you know, do the, the morning routine. And then the coffee's ready. And then I can, you know, pour my cup of coffee to, you know, come up here to the office and get ready to do the show. So she sets the coffee pot. We go to bed. It's all good. So I get up this morning. I let the dogs out. I feed the dogs. And I'm taking a shower. And I hear this stream of profanity coming out of the kitchen. And so I get out of the shower. I'm like, honey, what's going on? She goes, she goes, coffee maker worked. And I'm like, I said, that's great. That's it. So it went off on time. She goes, yeah, it went off on time. And uh, would have been good if I would actually put the coffee pot in the coffee maker. So <laughs> apparently <laughs> there's about 12 cups of coffee on the floor of the kitchen that she cleaned up. So, you know, so, you know, I, I, I help her finish cleaning it all up. It's all fine. And so I'm getting ready for Monday's trash day at our house. It's, we have trash on Mondays and Thursdays. So I'm getting the trash bags, you know, out of the kitchen. And, and I look down, and the instruction manual for the coffee maker is in the trash can. Because <laughs> she had read it. You know, I had to set everything up. She, I guess she didn't think she needed it anymore. But I couldn't resist. I could not resist that moment. Uh, so I, I looked over at my wife. She's sitting in the living room drinking her cup of coffee. And... Uh, I said, honey, I said, are you sure you want to throw away this instruction manual? And she, she kind of looks at me puzzled. I said, I'm sure there's something in here about putting the coffee pot in the coffee maker. Do you remember that website that used to run around called the Faces of Death? <laughs> yeah. 
That's the look I got. <laughs> so I am here, which means I escaped with my life, but I could not resist the, the moment of just uh, teasing my wife a bit. Anyway, coffee makers all good. All right, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, in this weekend's newsletter, we uh, talked a little bit about, and I kind of got to catch up from last week because a lot of stuff's been kind of going on. But uh, in this weekend's newsletter, so let me back up. Two weeks ago, we asked the question, because I've been getting a lot of emails about this market advance, low volatility, high complacency. You know, is this a market bubble, right? Is the market melting up? And there's certainly some evidence that you could suggest that that might be the case. There are some similarities to things that we've seen in the past. And... So it was, it was a valid question, and so we kind of explored the issue of market bubble versus just a maybe a short-term market top. And so we went through that analysis, and then I got a lot of questions after that. I was like, well, exactly what defines a market bubble, right? And so that's what we kind of went through this past weekend is talking specifically about more of what actually defines a a market bubble. And again, there's there's nothing there no two bubbles are alike in history, right? So you can't say this bubble is like that that bubble because there's differences. You can't say that this is like the 1999.com bubble because there's a lot of differences. Companies back then didn't have fundamentals. Companies today do, right? They have revenue and earnings, back then they didn't. Um, we didn't have a Federal Reserve going into overdrive. Today we do, right? So th th those type of things. <clears throat> but there are some other similarities, though, that can, can certainly we can point to and say there's certainly some concerns about a potential bubble in the markets because of activity that's happening. A lot of it is, remember is that bubbles are all about psychology. It's not really about the underlying fundamentals. It's about the psychology that drives the action in the market. And, and basically all a bubble is, and I, I tell you, what, we'll just get to the definition of a bubble and let's just start there and, and kind of work our way forward. But, you know, a bubble, so here's the definition. This is from Investopedia. It's not mine, so I just got a generic definition of a bubble. A market bubble is a cycle that is characterized by the rapid escalation of market value, particularly in the price of assets. Now, I'm going to disagree with that for a moment, and we'll get into it in a second, but a bubble is a cycle that's characterized by a rapid escalation of market value. That's correct. But you can't say a rapid rise in market value, particularly in the price of assets, because those are, the same, those are the same thing. The price of the assets is representative of the underlying value. So if the value is expanding rapidly, then that is the price of it going up really more than what the asset is worth. Typically, what creates a market bubble is a surge in asset prices driven by exuberant market behavior. During a market bubble, assets typically trade at a price that greatly exceeds the asset's intrinsic value. That's correct. Rather, the price is not aligned with the fundamentals of the asset. And so we, we see plenty of evidence of that right now. NVIDIA is a great example. It's a company that trades at 35 times price to sales. The price greatly exceeds the ability for the company to grow sales indefinitely to justify that price. So we have characteristics of a bubble in the markets because we do have many assets that are trading well above what the future value of that is going to be. We talked about, you know, wing stop trading at, you know, 30 times price to sell. So you just can't sell that many chicken wings. I don't know if there's enough chickens to sell that many chicken wings. A lot of wingless chickens running around. So, and, but, but bubbles throughout history have been common. And, you know, we can take a look back, you know, go back to 1977. There was the gold bubble. Then you had the Japan bubble in 89. You had Asia, 
you've had the internet dot com bubble, the housing bubble, the China bubble, you know, so forth and so on. And now we're into Bitcoin and AI and everything else. But, you know, these bubbles have existed all throughout history. The, these aren't anything new. And these exist in either one asset class or one market at a time. And they eventually blow up and they have a massive mean reverting event every time. So that's going to happen again at some point with all of these assets. And this happens in every asset class. So it doesn't matter what you think you own and this time is different. It's not. When an asset trades above its long-term intrinsic value, it will correct to that value ultimately. And importantly, I mean, we can go back and look at these bubbles going all the way back to the to to really the 1700s. And, you know, back then we had the Mississippi bubble, which occurred in, in 1718. And then you had the South Sea bubble, which was a South Sea trading company and had to do with debt issuance between um, the England had issued a bunch of debt. South Sea Corporation basically annuitized that debt and the whole thing blew up eventually. You had the Roaring Twenties, Nifty 50 Gold, all these bubbles throughout history, right? And so every one of these ended badly, as you would expect them to. And these are all a function, ultimately, of exuberance by investors. And every one of these bubbles in history... Everybody thought this time was different. This time was different because of A, B, or C. And it could be because of central bank policy. It could be because of, of, of you know, interest rates or whatever it was, right? There was always a reason that this bubble was different than the last bubble. Now, I'm not saying, now, let me just stop real quick. I'm not saying we're in a bubble, right? The question was, what defines a bubble? I'm just telling you what defines a bubble. <clears throat> now, you can apply that to whatever you what whatever you want right but i mean if you take a look at the top 10 weight in the current s p 500 you know we certainly have a very drastic expansion of market capitalization weight in the index of 10 stocks which certainly argues the question about what are investors thinking in terms of the value of these companies. Can these companies continue to grow earnings at a rate to support their market capitalization rates? And, and sure, the, the question is possible. Anything is possible. Anything can happen. It's a, it, you know, the uh, markets can do things that are illogical longer than you can think, but the question remains. Now, there's some things that we can look at that historically going back to 1900, have suggested that there's a bit more risk of market overvaluation. And if we take go back and, and if you take a look at the S&P 500 as an example, we're, we're not there yet, Brent. We'll come back. We'll come back to this chart right after the break. But if you long, take a long-term look at a logarithmic trend of the S&P 500, it's been a very steady advance since 1900. And almost like clockwork, you can look at where peaks and troughs in that market is over that period of time. But we'll talk about that when we come back from the break, even though Brent kind of jumped the gun here for me. Don't go, don't go away. We'll be right back. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com oh red i declare i plum missed that candy coffee whatever am i gonna do don't you worry little darling we'll watch it again on our youtube channel why red i 
never. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn to special topic discussions and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to The Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Food in total is now making up 30% of the average discretionary income. I believe it. I mean, that yeah. is our largest expense is food. Yeah. And, and we rarely eat out. The Real Investment Show podcast. Our biggest frustration at home is how do we do this cheaper? Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. Better. I agree. We're, we're running hunger games at our house. At realinvestmentadvice.com. <laughs> so, you know, if you can make it to the table without getting killed, you get to eat. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven-layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax-friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance, guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855-RIA-PLAN, or find us online at realinvestmentadvice.com, realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, plus each day's radio shows. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show. Real quick before I go further, I, you know, this show is always about entertainment value, right? We don't make recommendations here. We're not telling you to do something. Nothing like that, right? We're just here to talk about stuff and hopefully educate you a little bit. Uh, maybe tell you some things you didn't know, but we're not making your recommendations. And I, and I bring this up because I was, ta- I was telling you about my coffee story, my coffee pot story. And I got an email um, right after I told you the original story of the coffee pot where my Quasinart brand coffee pot blew up, basically. And so I got an email. The guy says, thank you very much. I showed my wife the video about the coffee pot. And we actually owned a Quasinart, which was working just fine. And she made me throw it away. So that's on you, right? Don't go show your wife stuff I say here on the show because it's going to get you in trouble. Just don't. And I highly advise you not to tell her to read the instruction manual about coffee pots. So just keep in mind, this is us guys, right? Trying to keep you out of trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Don't take marital advice from this show. This is not This is not what that's for. Anyway. All right. So just for the break, talking a little bit about market psychology. And so a market bubble is when price exceeds underlying value. That's what it is. So here's the important thing about market bubbles. 
There are three factors that make up a market bubble. Price, valuations, investor psychology. And that's it. And those have to be together because investor psychology is what drives price to the point that exceeds the underlying valuations. Right? These all work together. And market bubbles are psychological, period. It's a psychological phenomenon of markets. It is simply the idea that markets are just can go up. And it doesn't really matter what the value is. It's just going to keep going up. And so when investors bid up asset, now you can show the chart, Brent. So when investors bid up asset prices that exceed the underlying valuation or the earnings growth, this is when you previously get bubbles. And when price exceeds the exponential growth trend of the S&P by a large degree, this is when you've previously seen bubbles in history. And right now, so in 2020, the market exceeded the uh, price of the market, exceeded that exponential growth trend by a large degree. And then we had a big correction, of course, in 2021, 2022, sorry. And now we're back to kind of this approaching one of the highest levels in history that we haven't seen in a long time, this deviation from that long-term growth trend. Now, if prices are exceeding the long-term growth trend, then at the same time, valuations are going to be rising and valuations will exceed their long-term growth trend as well. Why? Because we're bidding up prices more than what the underlying valuations are. And so when valuations exceed their long-term growth trend. Again, these go hand in hand, obviously. Then you have the same type of, of issue with price versus deviation. So here we are. Currently, you've got valuations trading at uh, this, this chart's just a tad dated. Um, I built this chart probably about three weeks ago. Um, we were at 32 times earnings there. We're now at 34 times earnings because of the rise in the market. Um, and the deviation is 122% above the long-term exponential growth trend, one of the largest on record. Now, is this a bubble right now? I'm not saying we are or we aren't, but there's certainly some indications that the markets are certainly deviated and extended from the long-term growth trend. And as we've talked about before, again, this is all about psychology. So if you take a look at consumer confidence, Consumer confidence has been rising sharply as markets go up. And these kind of feed on each other. My asset prices go up. I feel better about my situation. My confidence goes up. I buy more stocks. They go up, et cetera, so forth and so on. And so there's a very high correlation between investor confidence, consumer confidence, and valuations of the market. Again, it's about psychology. And so this is the the thing that we struggle with, of course, um, you know, you know, over time is understanding these dynamics. And again, even if we're in a market bubble right now, which I'm going to be clear, I'm not saying we are, right? But even if we are, these things can last a lot longer than you think. Now, you know, household allocations right now um, are at a very, very high level. We're at one of the highest levels on record of household equity allocations. The only time we've been higher than this was in 2021 uh, when we had $5 trillion in stimulus coming into the markets, right? So we corrected some of that household allocation amount during 2022 sell-off, and then now we're rapidly approaching an all-time high. And at the rate we're going, we'll get there you know, sooner than later. Retail investor allocations on, on equities are rising sharply. Allocations of cash are dropping, increasing their allocations to equities. Not surprising, again, just because of what's going on in the markets. Professional managers are about as long equities as they can get. And normally when they are as long equities as they are, as they are right now, you've been pretty much close to a, a peak in markets, at least temporarily. So short-term correction, et cetera. But that's also been coincident with much bigger corrections in markets as well. And then if we take a look at 
net bullish sentiment. So that you take a look at professional retailer uh, retail investors bullish sentiment, less their bearish sentiment. And I use a 13-week average to kind of smooth out the volatility. It's at one of the highest levels that we've seen. Last time we were this high was going into 2022, and you had the correction in 2022. So again, just everywhere you look, you know, it's certainly indicative that we have a very, very extremely bullish market. Now, does that mean we're in a bubble? No, it doesn't. Does it mean we're not in a bubble? No, it doesn't. Again, trying to say we're in a bubble or not, it's always very difficult because bubbles are only obvious in hindsight. We'll look back at some point and we'll say, oh yeah, that was the bubble, right? We could have said that in 2022. Markets were surging higher and we had all this liquidity coming into the market. You had this clear market melt up going on, but we could have said the same thing in 2019. See, and now, the, now that ramp up in 2019 going into 2020 doesn't look all that obnoxious but back then it was it was it was we had this massive ramp up markets were detached from everything in 2019 and then we just dwarfed that in 2021 because of all that stimulus so it's hard to look back and say yeah that was the bubble peak right we know about the financial crisis we know about the dot-com crisis because there was an event that went along with the peak and what we haven't had yet is that event that goes along with the peak so that's why it's hard to say, oh, we're in a bubble because we haven't had an event occur yet. And we'll know after the fact at some point. It could be five years from now. It could be 10 years from now, whatever. But at some point, the deviation of price from exponential growth trends, from underlying valuations, that will correct itself. There will be a mean reverting event at some point. That's just a function of, of math. But... Again, that doesn't mean today, it doesn't mean tomorrow, it doesn't mean this year. And this is the problem for investors. And, you know, this is why we talk about not allowing psychology to override what's going on in the markets. It's, a, it's important to be aware of these things so we know what defines a bubble. But the identification of the bubble is very difficult until after the fact. Of course, after the fact, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good anyway. But the, the point is, is that we never know where that bubble popped until after the fact. But we do have some of those ingredients. And it's worth realizing we have those ingredients. Now, again, it doesn't mean not to participate. There's nothing wrong with this market right now. Again, as we've talked about technically, just keep a watch on the 20-day moving average. Until we violate that moving average, this is the most boring market ever. It just goes up every day for the most part. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And again, as we've talked about before, it's, you know, a issue of psychology and what we've got to be careful of is our own psychology that we don't allow our own psychology of being overly bearish or overly cautious, whatever it is, to push us to sell too soon. Now, that doesn't mean you can't take profits. It doesn't mean you can't rebalance your portfolio. It doesn't mean you can't do some risk management along the way. There's nothing wrong with that. That's healthy and that's smart. But making a decision to go all to cash because, oh, I think this is a bubble, so I'm going to go all to cash is likely not going to play out well, at least in the short term. And what happens is that, and I've seen this over the years, people will do this. They'll say, okay, I, you know, it's just, it, this is stupid. I'm out. I'm going to go cash and I'll just wait for the correction. And then the correction doesn't come. And then it doesn't come and it doesn't come. And finally, they just give up and they get back in right when the market corrects. And that's just that's just psychology at work. So, again, good to know. Again, as we wrote about in the newsletter, this is good information to know. What's a market bubble? What drives it? How's it created? What's what's going on right now that that certainly has some risk associated with it? That's in the newsletter. But again, this is something we're aware of, something we keep a watch on, but not something we act on at the moment. All right, quick break. We'll be right back. Get ready to wrap up the show.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high-cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Invest. Show. When it comes to wealth management, most people think of stocks and bonds, but it's like enjoying one layer in a seven layer cake. At RIA Advisors, we want to make sure you get your cake and eat it too. Social Security, Medicare, creating a tax friendly retirement paycheck, perhaps you're saving for college. How about life insurance? Guaranteed income solutions, all along with comprehensive planning. At RIA, a holistic approach to your money is our priority. Call us today, 855 RIA Plan, or find us online at Real Investment Advice. Com, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. So uh, just get ready to kind of wrap a couple of things up. So again, you know, out last week, my apologies. Um, just lost my voice. I, would, you know, I wasn't even sick. That was the thing. I was like, if at least I was going to be out. I'd like to be sick, right? Because at least my wife will take care of me. But I wasn't even sick. I just couldn't talk. And she thought that was great. Um, so <laughs> now I've got a whole week to make up. <laughs> I got all kinds of lines. Um, but anyway, so I'm back and uh, got a lot of stuff to catch up on. But, you know, again, just, you know, real quick, um, you know, last week, of course, was, you know, we had some inflation data out and, and you know, came a little bit hotter than expected. And we had the, you know, uh, Fed conversations with the FOMC meeting. Nothing changed there at all. And I thought what was interesting with the FOMC meeting is basically they just said, yeah, don't pay attention to the dot plot. Um, by the way, and just talking about the dot plot, don't pay attention to the dot plot. It is worthless. Um, every quarter I track their estimates for GDP, for inflation, for employment, and they're always wrong. Um, going back to 2011, when they started issuing these quarterly reports, they always issue out very high expectations of economic activity, and we wind up with much lower rates of economic activity. You just because of the debt, ultimately. And we're issuing debt just as fast as we can right now um, to fund bills. I thought it was interesting this morning. Um, you know, we just passed this uh, 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 obnoxiously huge spending bill to keep the government funded. Um, and now we're going to have to come up with another $5 billion for the immigration crisis. Now, I don't know how well that's going to go over. We're going to spend $5 billion to help illegal immigrants, but you got homeless people, homeless Americans, homeless citizens that we're not giving any help to. So, you know, I'm not sure how this is going to play out in the, in the actual media before an election, but, you know, we'll see what happens. But we're just spending a lot of money. And, you know, every crisis that comes along of whatever it is, we find out a way to spend more money on it. And it's money, unfortunately, that we don't have. And, in fact, that's something that we touched a bit on Friday on um, our report on Friday talking about the Social Security and Pension Fund crisis. 
is you now have $174 trillion unfunded liability for Social Security and, and Medicare. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with that, except we just keep adding more and more people to the role, and you have fewer and fewer people that are working to pay into it. And it's just a math math. It's just it's just a math problem. Right? It's just you have this many people paying in, and you have this many people taking out, and those have to balance. And we have what's called actuarial tables, right? So, so when you look at a pension fund, as an example, like your co company pension, the company says, okay, I have this much money in this pool, and I have this many people I expect to retire over this period of uh, period of time. And if this pool of money grows at such and such percent, then I'll have enough to pay out all these people. Well, that's all fine and dandy. Unless, A, the assets don't grow as fast as you expected them to. Or B, you have more people retire faster than what you were planning on. If one of those two things happens, then your pension isn't solvent. Right? I mean, it's just math. It's just it's just money and math. That's all it is. Same thing for Social Security. Look, I'm not saying anybody's particular pension is about to go belly up. I'm just using an example. Social Security and Medicare are exactly the same thing. You have this many people in the population. You expect people to retire at a certain pace. And as long as everybody's paying into the system that's supposed to pay in and you're paying out at the pace you're expected to pay out, then it's okay. You'll last until a certain period of time before you run out of money. Well, the problem is, is you're getting retirees over the last couple of years because of a surging stock market. They're retiring a lot faster than people expected. People are claiming Social Security sooner than expected, and they're, and they're claiming it at a much more rapid pace than expected. And again, nothing wrong with that. It just messes up your actuarial tables. Because you were planning on a certain amount of payout over time and you've got a certain amount of income coming in that you've got to pay out and those are, are starting to become imbalanced. And then if you take for Social Security as an example, you add more people to the roles, which is kind of a politician's favorite thing to do. It's like, OK, oh, we have another distressed group of people over here. Um, and I want votes, so I'm going to put this group. I'm going to give these people some, you know, Social Security benefits. And so we, so since the 1960s, we keep adding more and more people to the roles that weren't necessarily paying in, and that's okay. But that's become the slush fund of of support for Americans that exceeds the amount number of people paying into the system, and so that's the problem, right? And so the way to fix that, of course, is we've got to issue more debt. <coughs> Excuse me. One second. The one thing that always gets paid in our budget. So when you look at our budget and how we spend money, you have mandatory and discretionary spending. The mandatory spending in our budget is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the prescription drug benefit, interest on the debt, and the military. They get paid. They get paid, period. It doesn't matter what happens. You shut down the government, they still get paid. You decide to not do something, they still get paid. Now, discretionary spending... They don't get paid. That's why when we shut down the government, we close national parks and stuff like that. That's discretionary. But Social Security and Medicare gets paid, period. And if you don't have the money for it, where do you get the money to pay it? You issue debt. And this is why our debt keeps going up at such a rapid pace. Because the expenditures on these programs are going up. Interest on the debt is surging because we're issuing more and more debt at higher rates. And so all that is mandatory spending that has to be done. And so in order to, 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 to make those expenditures, we've got to issue more debt. And so we keep having to pass these bigger and bigger spending bills. And again, since we don't have a budget, 
we just have to come up to this wall and say, well, if we don't issue this spending bill, this continuing resolution of $1.7 trillion, then you know we're going to default on all of our spending obligations. So we've got to pass this thing. And so we pass these bills, and then we wind up you know, spending $15 million to send to Egypt to pay for college tuition for Egyptians. Which we do that, but we complain about student loans here that we don't want to forgive, right? <laughs> so, you know, we have these spending programs. And again, you know, if, if you take a look at this latest spending bill, um, <laughs> it was so full of pork, it might as well have just been called the baloney bill because, I mean, there was just all kinds of stuff. Even Dianne Feinstein, who passed away, had several earmarks in this bill for funding programs that have nothing to do with the actual budget itself or the actual budgetary needs of the government. It's just, oh, oh wait, like, here's the spending we've got to do, but let's also add on all this other spending of stuff we want to do, these pet projects. And see, nobody reads these bills. So we pass these things. And then we find out later what we're spending money on. And the problem is, as always, is the spending is non-productive. Sending $15 million, again, that's a drop in the bucket. Who cares, right? That's left pocket change when you're talking $1.7 trillion, but it's just kind of the point. Sending $15 million to Egypt to fund Egyptian college tuition doesn't produce any economic activity for the U.S., When we spend debt, if we can spend debt productively, there's nothing wrong with that, right? So if we spend debt to build a power plant or to, um, you know, reconstruct an energy grid, those type of things, things that we can charge a service fee for Americans to use, that debt pays for itself. It creates jobs at the time that we are building those, those projects, and that creates a long-term return for the country on that debt. So we should look at our debt usage as an investment. I'm, yes, I'm going to borrow money, but I'm going to invest that money in a project. And that money, that project will return on the investment over time. If we did that, our debt is productive and creates economic prosperity over time. But the way we use debt now is simply to spend without respect to the return, and most of the spending that we do now has a negative return on investment. In other words, we spend, we we have this debt that we borrowed the money at, and we basically lit the money on fire, and we still have to pay back the debt with interest. And that's why we have this problem of surging debt. But that impedes economic growth because the debt is non-productive. It's also disinflationary. And this is why inflation will be lower in the future and interest rates will be lower in the future in order to sustain that debt issuance. It's also why the Fed is going to have to reverse QT and go back to QE because they're going to have to monetize 30% of the debt issuance in the future. Okay, wraps up the show for the day. We'll be back uh, tomorrow, of course. We'll pick up. We've got an article out in the morning that we'll cover here on the show as well. Um, have a great day. We'll see you back here tomorrow.